And because I'm not sure what has been covered at the um, other um, contributions to the conference, I thought I'd try and just put a bit of context around some of the things I'll be speaking about. I think the first thing that um, would be important to understand is just what goes into making performance. And of all the things that you talk about measuring at conferences like this, I can assure you the most difficult thing that anyone can ever measure is um, human performance, particularly for an elite athlete with the kind of resolution and reliability that's um, important in my field. And one of the things that's also important to really know is that so many different things go into making up performance on the day. And even if you can change one aspect of all these little contributions here, it may not be the limiting factor and therefore have um, some flow on to the actual performance. But um, next slide, please. Today we're going to be talking about one aspect of this pathway, and that is looking at um, metabolic flexibility. And I've defined that um, on the next slide as the ability of the athlete to be able to have available fuel supplies and the ability to use them at the rate and for the length of time that their event requires. Could I have the next slide, please? And just to put a little bit of more context around this um, interaction between training and competition, I just wanted to point out um, some differences in philosophies, and that is during, during the training phase, we're looking at ways in which we can further the adaptation that exercise is bringing to the human. But during the competition phase, we're looking at ways in which we can overcome some of the limitations to performance. And in some, some areas, the kinds of um, contributions will be directly opposed in the training and competition phases. So if we talk about the um, topic for today, and that is um, looking at whether carbohydrate is really important to elite athletes in endurance events, if you're a Twitter follower like Stu, the world is simplified these days. It's almost a combat sport in that sports nutrition seems to be about those in the red corner loving carbohydrates and those in the, the blue corner loving fat. And we're going to duke it out to see who's the ultimate winner. I think it's a very unfortunate um, perspective on sports nutrition that it's all a one-size-fits-all or a black-and-white view of things. And what I've been trying over my career to do is to provide a bit more complexity or more understanding about things. So there's never an answer to does something work, but more so under what situations might this be appropriate and under other situations might that be appropriate. So if we go to the next slide and, and look to see what um, people who don't read Twitter are, are reading on this topic, we can find even in the peer-reviewed literature, there's an unfortunate bias towards a very simplistic view of sports nutrition. Um, next slide, please. And if we just take this review as, a, um, as an example of this, here we can see some of the, um, the current um, ideas about carbohydrate, that it's an old idea, that we've had this period of time where we've been telling athletes universally to eat large amounts of it regardless of um, their athletic goals. Um, this has largely been a conspiracy theory behind it, that um, carbohydrate's an unfortunate nutrient because of what it does to insulin responses. But if we move our diets away from carbohydrate, we can adapt to that. And that's a great thing because of the plentiful supply of fat that we have available, even in the leanest of athletes. And this can be something to enhance endurance performance. And the core goes out to um, overturn this universal message of the high carbohydrate diet for athletic performance. Next slide, please. This is not um, the only um, peer reviewed paper to, um, to try and promote this kind of narrative. Here we have some other reviews which give us this um, universal message that the basis of sports nutrition is promoting high carbohydrate at all times for all athletes for all goals. Next slide, please. So before we go any further into the, um, the lecture, what I'd like to do is really provide the truth about what the current sports nutrition guidelines say in, in um, view of carbohydrate intake. And we can break it into the training phase and the competition phase separately. And we no longer talk about high carbohydrate diets or even absolute amounts of carbohydrate all in sports nutrition, but rather we talk about carbohydrate availability as looking at the amount of carbohydrate that's consumed in comparison to the fuel needs of the muscle to undertake the, the workload that's being done in training or competition phase. 
And in fact, the guidelines now talk about athletes needing to periodise both the total amount of carbohydrate they're consuming because of the different types of um, fuel requirements they'll have over different days or different parts of their season or different kinds of events, but also that there are some kinds of sessions in which it's good to have high carbohydrate availability to drive performance, but in other sessions it's less important and there may be even some advantages, and we'll hear about this in a, a later lecture, on having the muscle do exercise under low carbohydrate availability circumstances. When we come to the competition phase, again, it's a matter of matching carbohydrate availability to the requirements of the event. But in this scenario, the message is to try and match those fuel requirements, both in terms of providing the muscle with a very efficient fuel, but also in providing the brain with the opportunity to, to sense it so that it can feel better and drive the pacing towards better performance. So I think it's necessary to have that background that we do no longer promote this um, universal high carbohydrate message to set things right before we look at some alternatives to that. Uh, next slide, please. So here's my very simplistic view of what the muscle has on offer in terms of fuel substrates when we get into that competitive phase. And if we go to the next slide, we can see that there's been a number of different strategies used over the, the years to try and find ways of making those substrates either more available or more optimally or efficiently used. And if we look at the ways in which carbohydrate has been manipulated, both to increase the muscle glycogen store of it or the amount of um, exogenous glucose coming in, there's very good evidence to show that in events where fuel is limiting from glycogen, that these kinds of strategies enhance performance. And even in the non-glycogen limiting sports, there's now good evidence to show that taking in carbohydrate during the event can have a role in improving performance through the, um, the mouth sensing of carbohydrate and the brain response. By contrast, if you look at the different kinds of strategies which have been used to try and make um, fatty acids or sources of fat available to the muscle in larger amounts, acutely, there's very little evidence to show that leads to better performance. And so we would see that it's not just the availability of fat that's the limiting factor, as Francis has told us previously, but rather we need to find ways in which we can drive the muscle to be able to utilise it more efficiently. And so we'll now look at the two strategies at the bottom of this slide, ways in which we could try and adapt the muscle, either in a chronic form or in a shorter form just before competition, as a way of trying to provide both the availability of the fatty acids as well as an improved capacity to use them as an exercise fuel. Next slide, please. So if I take all the literature which has um, looked at these kinds of strategies in trained individuals with a chronic application of a high-fat diet, we can break them down into two different forms, ones in which there's been a ketogenic form of the low-carb, high-fat diet in which carbohydrate is very restricted, leading to um, prolonged um, ketogenic responses. Fat intake is very high, and you can see that um, that means by um, omission that protein is also kept at a very moderate level. We can compare that with the other strategy which has been used, which is a, a more flexible diet in which fat is also increased, but carbohydrate is certainly kept below the muscle fuel needs for most endurance athletes and their training loads but um, not as, as dramatically as the ketogenic diet. So I've chosen to um, summarise all the studies which have had either, either of these approaches in trained individuals with a measure of performance that is um, meaningful in, in my world of sport. And if we move to the next slide, we can see I've been able to summarise all those studies on a, a single graph. Now, I'm not expecting you to read that slide. I'm just wanting to give you the um, perspective that really the amount of literature we're dealing with is very small. And I've tried to um, summarise what the bottom line was in that last column. And you'll see I've tried to be generous in not just saying yes or no, but perhaps um, trying to identify from the studies the conditions under which these, these um, strategies might be useful. You can see that there's um, one study that's picked out in blue, and that's the only study that has appeared until recently and in the peer-reviewed literature using the ketogenic form of the low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. And it's this study that's getting all the airplay now and seems to have been reinvented by many of the people who talk about it. If we go to the next slide, we'll have a look at it in, in a bit more detail. 
this um, study was a well-controlled study in which five well-trained cyclists were um, in a hospital situation, so they were provided with a well-monitored diet. It was a, um, a study which involved the exposure to four weeks of the ketogenic, high-fat, very restricted carbohydrate diet with training, with endurance rather than performance, time to exhaustion measured pre and post. And you can see there's an order effect in this diet that the, the subjects had an extra four weeks of training to be taken into account as well as their exposure to the diet when you look at the um, pre to post endurance. If you have a look at the next slide, we can see what happens to muscle glycogen under those circumstances. And you can see that there's a, a reduction in um, muscle glycogen in the pre-exercise situation as a result of the exposure to the high fat diet. And there's much um, smaller utilization of that glycogen throughout the exercise bout. And we should point out at this moment that the exercise is undertaken at about 60% of VO2 max. So it's very low intensity exercise compared to what elite athletes would be doing in even the longest events that you would see in um, the Olympic Games. If you move to the, the next slide, so we can see the, the sort of the money shot, the effect on endurance. There was no difference in endurance between the pre and post conditions. And this has um, been even further explored by looking at um, the results of the individual subjects on the next slide. And you can see that the results of this study are really largely driven by one subject who had a much larger response to the high fat diet, was able to go much longer after the high fat diet and an extra four weeks of training than the other subjects. And so really this whole um, philosophy of the low carb high fat diet, or at least the ketogenic form of it, really is um, reliant on that one person. I'd love to meet him and shake his hand. If you have a look at the next slide, though, I've um, chosen to um, provide to you the interpretation of the study as was um, written by the authors at the time. And they noted um, the, their marvellous results were that they're able to show that under these um, periods of adaptation or exposure to this very limited carbohydrate intake, the human body could adapt to learn to be able to have the same capacity for low to moderate intensity exercise as with a high carbohydrate diet, but in other um, parts of the study or other data that were collected in the study, they showed that this was at the detriment of the athlete's ability to do high intensity exercise. And it's interesting to go back to this finding because it's not very um, clear from the way that it's been talked about in the, in the current media. If we go to the, the next slide then, I think we can say that adaptation to the, the high fat diet for a prolonged period, at least at the current level of evidence, doesn't show any major benefits or consistent evidence of benefits. And so therefore we might move to the final strategy, which is trying to adapt the athlete to both the high fat diet, but then restore carbohydrates so that they would, ident well, in theory at least, have the best of both worlds with fuel sources both being available and available to be used efficiently. And if we go to the next slide, you can see again, I've tried to sum summarize the literature and you can see here again that there's a very small number of studies on which we're trying to um, make our conclusions. And again, I've tried to be generous with picking out different scenarios under which this kind of um, adaptation might be useful. And so we'll go through some of these studies in order to pick these out. So the next um, slide simply gives you a, an overview of the model that we spent a decade trying to pursue, where we had athletes undertake a five-day period of adaptation to a high-fat diet, which were able to show, um, retool the muscle to be able to be better at utilising fat as an exercise substrate. We then, after that period, put them back on one day of a high-carbohydrate diet to restore glycogen. And in the first study that we did, we had them then perform a period of exercise with a time trial at the end under conditions of low carbohydrate availability. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that the expected changes in glycogen would occur, that it's reduced with the period of the low carbohydrate diet, but with one day of carbohydrate restoration, we restore glycogen levels again. The next slide shows what happens when you exercise under those conditions, and you can see with the carbohydrate utilisation figures over that um, 120 minutes of steady state exercise, there's a, a, a reduced reliance on carbohydrate as an exercise fuel as a result of that adaptation, 
despite the fact that the muscle is full of glycogen. Next slide. If you have a look at the time trial at the end of that bout, though, we saw no difference in performance from a statistical significance point of view, but some differences and in some um, individual variability that a coach or athlete might be interested in. Next slide, please. If you have a look at the individual responses, you can see that's largely due to one subject who had a very bad response to the high carbohydrate um, diet when under the conditions of low carbohydrate availability for performance. And if you have a look at the next slide, you can see that that's explained by the effect of performing under low carbohydrate availability on blood glucose levels. And in that subject, there was a very marked response. If you go to the, the next slide, you can see that we've repeated the study again. This time we had the performance being done under conditions where we fed breakfast of carbohydrate, fed carbohydrate throughout the exercise bout. Despite the plentiful supplies of carbohydrate, we still saw these differences in utilization by the muscle um, throughout the steady state bout. But this time when we had a look at a time trial at the end of it, on the next slide, you can see Sorry, there's the hierarchy there. You can see what happened in two of the studies together, that despite putting more carbohydrate back into the picture, you still retain a difference between the utilisation of carbohydrate after the fat adaptation. And in the next slide, we'll see the performance changes. And you can see pretty well no difference in performance of the time trial as a result of that adaptation, despite the very different substrate utilisation and availability. We wondered whether we simply hadn't gone long enough with our studies, and so we did the follow-up study on the next slide, where we went out to a four-hour bout of exercise with a one-hour time trial at the end. Again, very high amounts of carbohydrate being consumed before exercise, during exercise, and with high levels of glycogen in the muscle. We still see these very robust differences in carbohydrate utilization with the fat adaptation. Next slide. We um, traced what happened with the carbohydrate that was ingested during that bout and found that there was no effect of the fat adaptation on that, therefore convincing us that it was simply a, a change in glycogen utilisation patterns as a result of the fat adaptation. And in the next slide, we also saw a difference in um, performance of a, a marginal trend that a statistician would have said was insignificant but again, something that might be of use in the world of sport where these small differences make a difference to the outcomes. If we have a look at the next slide to see what happens with the individual differences, again, we see one subject who is an outlier that um, creates that difference. And when we looked at what was happening with that subject, he had a bad experience with um, consuming the large amounts of glucose during that trial and had a gastrointestinal upset. We've still left that data in, but that's largely the, the reason for that difference. And in the next slides, when we were challenged by the idea that um, we might have had a, a type 1, type 2 error because of the small sample size, we ran some more subjects. Next slide, you can see that um, once you add more subjects, you completely wash out the differences of that individual subject. And so we began to feel that there may be just individuals or individual scenarios for which this, um, this strategy might be useful. If we move forward to the, to the next slide, um, we did, with looking at um, some of the, the muscle changes, uh, identify the ways in which the adaptations were occurring in the muscle to increase hormone-sensitive lipase, to increase the CD36. And so we could explain what was happening in the muscle, but we couldn't explain why that wasn't translating into a performance difference until we started looking in the opposite direction. Next slide. And that was when we teamed up with Lawrence Spreet and Trent Stellingworth to have a look at what was ha happening to the carbohydrate side of the story. And we came across the finding that our adaptation strategy certainly upregulated fat utilisation, but it was at the detriment of carbohydrate utilisation pathways. And in particular, um, there was a, a downregulation of PDH activity. Um, if you look at the next slide, you'll see why that's important. And this is data that comes from a study from Tim Noakes' lab where they looked at our fat adaptation carbohydrate restoration story and this time implemented a protocol of measuring performance 
in a pure sense of having athletes do a 100-kilometre um, time trial. There was no significant difference between the performance of that 100-kilometre time trial between a carbohydrate-rich diet and the fat adaptation plus carbohydrate restoration story, but it wasn't the um, significance of the total time that was important in the study. It was looking at pieces within the study. And you can see on the graph there, these are the data showing the um, power outputs when the cyclists were required to do a 4K sprint in the middle of this time trial. And in the next slide, you'll see what happens when they start moving into the higher intensities doing a 1K sprint, where we start seeing significant detriment to performance of that high intensity exercise. And so our bottom line in um, looking at our literature on the next slide was to say, yes, there's some great things that fat adaptation can do in terms of enhancing fat utilisation, but the detriment to the carbohydrate story makes it suddenly start becoming not a good idea for athletes who need to do high intensity work, even when it's just small, but very um, event changing strategies within a race. It's not how long you can go at 60% of VO2 max in the peloton. It's whether you can sprint to the line or surge up the hill, etc., that determines the outcome. Next slide. So we were thinking about um, some of the ways in which you could communicate these ideas to an athlete about why it was important not to throttle your ability to um, move carbohydrate efficiently through the TCA cycle. And some of the, um, the words that I would use to athletes were to describe how efficient carbohydrate oxidation is in terms of providing ATP for the amount of glycogen that you've got, but also the idea that it's a very efficient fuel in terms of oxygen utilisation, that compared to fat oxidation, you'll get a greater yield of ATP for the amount of oxygen that is supplied to the muscle. Next slide, please. We also pointed out to the athlete the whole range of disadvantages of undertaking some of these fat adaptation strategies. Um, apart from being very difficult to follow, there are a lot of um, inconveniences in terms of how people feel in training, how it might interfere with their ability to monitor their training or do the high intensity sorts of training that it's important to drive performance. So we were very surprised over the last three years to find a re-emergence of this high, carb, high fat low carb story next um next slide so and we'll move to the next slide after that largely driven by the popular media through books and um, through all the social media we now have and if you move to the next slide you can see examples of lots of different ways in which this um idea has been communicated through youtube through twitter through facebook you name the social media there'll be a, some narrative that's been driven behind it with very emotive stories. Next slide. There's a lot of information that's coming out that high-performing high athletes have moved over to this trend. And next slide. You can see also that the punters love it as well. Lots of people will come out with their anecdotes and testimonials about how terrific the change has been for them. Next slide, please. So at the end of last year, I had the opportunity to respond to that. In the absence of any new data, I um, tried to recapture the story to say exactly what I've just told you then, that the narrative, I think, has been distorted about what the real sports nutrition guidelines are, that the um, disadvantage of being on a short-term or a chronic high-fat diet would be to reduce metabolic flexibility and ability to use carbohydrate efficiently. And there's not a, a good story that I would give to my athletes in order to support that. But I did point out that it hadn't been adequately tested. So in the last five minutes, I'd just like to share with you some very, very recent data that we've been collecting in um, the, the last four months of my life in a project we've called Supernova, where we've tried to take some of the highest performing athletes that we could get um, recruited into our study. We worked with um, some elite race walkers we were able to recruit 29 of these race walkers from all around the world. And I need to thank Jared Talent, one of Australia's best um, race walkers, for his um, contribution to making this happen. Um, probably 20 of these athletes will be performing in Rio. And we had them undertake a three-week high-volume training program with these um, being divided into three different dietary strategies. We had the high-carbohydrate availability strategy, we had the low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diet, 
And we also put in this new periodised approach to carbohydrate availability being changed around different sessions to, to meet specific goals. And we've done a whole series of um, testing pre and post. Now, I can share a little bit of data. It's all been crunched as we're um, speaking. I can show you just um, a quick snapshot of the, um, the training program. Our um, race walkers were walking 120 to 160K a week on average, some up to 200K a week. We had um, the three different diets produced by a chef to make sure they actually occurred and that they were enjoyable. We were able to match the carbohydrate intake on the high carbohydrate and the periodized carbohydrate approach, but it was spread very differently over the week or over the day. But with the low carbohydrate diet, we achieved the goals of keeping carbohydrate to less than 50 grams a day and um, we matched the protein over the three diets. So the data I'd just like to share with you today comes from looking at that little comment that I made earlier about what happens to the economy or oxygen utilisation when you switch from a carbohydrate to a, a fat-burning um, beast. And on the next slide, I'll just show you some um, results from a couple of the different tests that we did. I need to, to show you just in background that um, we tried to allow them to lose a little bit of weight over the period of, of the study, but to try and um, energy match it as well as possible. Um, but in the carbohydrate um, diets, that was achieved. But with the low-carb, high-fat diet, there was a small weight loss, which was uh, associated with the loss of glycogen and, and water. And in the next slide, we'll see some of the, um, the data about um, economy. This comes from a graded economy test that was done pre and post. This is a standardised um, test that's done amongst race walkers where they do a four-stage economy walk on the treadmill um, over four different speeds, usually 12, 13, 14, 15 k an hour, which sort of moves them through the pace they would be doing at um, a 50 k race to a, a 20 k race. And you can see the, um, the change from P to post with the low carb, high fat diet that they've now moved to. Um, this is the second speed, so about 13 k an hour, so that's around about the 50 k pace. And if you go to the next slide, we have a look at the economy or the oxygen utilisation at that speed. So this is, as I said, around about the pace or just um, below the pace that they would be walking in a 50k race. You can see that um, the oxygen utilisation increased in the low-carb, high-fat group as a result of their diet, even though they were now lighter. So if we put that as a relative um, VO2 max, that difference would, also, that would be greater. And in almost all cases there was an increase in um, the use of oxygen of about four mils per kilo or about um, that 5% as we predicted um, as a result of the exposure to the high fat diet. If you look to the next slide, we had a, another test that was done pre and post. This was taking them out and doing a 25K long walk at that same second speed around 13K an hour. This time the um, high carb groups and the periodized groups had pre-event breakfast and carbohydrate during as would be um, followed by the guidelines whereas the, the, the low carb high fat group ate their low fat high carb breakfast and, and during the walk and again you can see from the RER data that we're moving to a, a, a high fat oxidation in that group. I've just normalised and um, averaged it out across the 25k and if we go to the next slide Again, we see that same story. There was an improvement in economy with the periodized um, diet, but a, a loss of economy or a greater utilization of oxygen for the same walking speed as a result of the, the low carb, high fat diet. And amongst the race walking community, your economy, your ability to be able to produce speed for your utilization of oxygen is considered a very important part of um, performance. So if I move to the, to the last slide, and talk about um, why some people seem to find this fat adaptation works for them because it's really important to confront what we're hearing about with anecdotes and testimonials about why people think it's such a good idea. And these are the kinds of scenarios under which it might be either less detrimental or may have some advantages to the performance of athletes. And they would be in events where fat utilisation is important and where there's no requirement for an ability to work at high intensities, or in events or scenarios or individuals in which it's not possible to take in enough carbohydrate to meet those guidelines. Next slide. 
other reasons that we could um, explain why people feel marvellous or think they perform better when they're on the low-carb, high-fat diets is certainly the bandwagon effect, um, the order effect, the fact that sometimes it's the first time people have started training properly or eating in a way that's organised, um, and all the other ways in which people just love jumping on bandwagons. But the last um, slide shows another reason why often people say that they enjoy or they do better on the, the um, low-fat, high-carb diet. And this is just an example of this. This is a um, piece of literature from the Australian newspapers which have talked about one of our football clubs following the, um, the low-carb, high-fat diet after a visit by Tim Noakes. And if you read the newspaper cutting very closely on the next slide, you can see that what they're actually doing is following a paleo diet, which is not a low-carb, high-fat diet, and they're not even following that because they're having rice and milk as well. So there's a big difference between what people say they're doing and what they think they're doing and some of the actual um, ideas that are being promoted. So always have a grain of salt. And so my final slide leaves you with where I think we are with um, the, the low-carb, high-fat message. I'm aware of um, some new studies that have come out in the, the last um, couple of months, which are not intervention studies, but they're cross-sectional studies, looking at differences between athletes that have adapted to these diets for long periods of time. They don't measure performance, but they measure some interesting things about metabolism. But when I go to the Rio, I'll be interested not just in what's happening at the level of the muscle, but in what's happening in terms of athletes getting to the finish line as quickly as possible. And my last slide sums up where I feel we're at now, and based on the evidence and based on what we know about how important it is to be able to work at high intensities in almost every event that I can think of, I don't think I'm at the point yet where I want to give up my um, interest and um, ideas and support around the high carbohydrate availability message. Um, and I'm hoping that there'll be some more opportunities to do research that can help work out whether there are further things that we need to look at in terms of the high fat diet or whether there are other strategies that we can use in the more periodized way in which we can actually improve metabolic flexibility overall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.